Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Phil and welcome to Grounded, the series which looks at airlines of yesteryear. This episode will take a look at New Airline Inc. from Las Vegas, better known as one of the many incarnations of National Airlines. In 1994, Michael Conway, one of the co-founders of America West Airlines, was ousted as chief executive, with the airline struggling, having been operating under Chapter 11 bankruptcy for three years. America West had expanded rapidly in its early years, resulting in their bankruptcy. After clashing one too many times with the new chairman, who had been brought in specially to turn the airline round, Conway was discharged. Conway had an idea, and he had made a lot of business contacts during his time at America West. At the same time, some of the Las Vegas hotel and casino owners were getting concerned, as the traffic at McCarran Airport had dropped 2.4%, between 1997 and the first half of 1998. No airline was using the Las Vegas airport as a hub, and they had started to redeploy aircraft from the leisure-based Las Vegas market onto higher yielding business routes elsewhere. They were doubly worried, as they had committed themselves to adding an extra 21,000 new hotel rooms by the year 2000, with these new rooms generating demand for an additional 11,000 daily airline seats, it seemed like Conway could be onto a winner. New Airline Inc. was founded on the 12th of April 1995 with $800,000 of seed capital. This was later increased to $2.8 million. Things were progressing slow and steady, with various executives and directors joining the company over three years until it was time for the big launch. There were several names backing the company. Both Harris Entertainment and the Rio Hotel and Casino put in $15 million each, with Wexford Capital adding a further $7 million. Wexford Capital were an investment firm which had previously acquired the assets of the defunct Mark Air. They were heavily invested in the struggling Midway Airlines and had acquired Republic Airways holdings just a few months earlier. On July 30th, 1998, a press conference was held at Las Vegas McCarran Airport to formally announce the launch of National Airlines. Rather bizarrely, they hadn't actually secured the rights to the national name yet and were still in discussions with the rights holder the Pan Am Liquidating Corporation. This minor detail was soon sorted, and a day later, New Airline Inc. was renamed as National Airlines Inc. National Airlines would operate flights from Las Vegas to a variety of destinations with the single aim of bringing visitors to Vegas. It was a win-win idea. The airline makes a profit from the passengers, and the hotel and casinos will take a tidy profit off the visitors. Remember, in Vegas, the house always wins. But don't forget, this is grounded after all. To further streamline the experience for passengers and hotel guests, national flight centres were opened in the lobbies of both Harris and the Rio. Each flight centre offered reservations and ticket purchasing, seat assignments and baggage checking. The airline even had a new slogan, everything's better up here. National Airlines had a frequent flyer programme with a difference, national comps. And unlike other carriers which collected miles, national comps could collect points. These were redeemable for upgrades and free flights, but could also be redeemed at various Vegas hotels, further incentivizing people to fly national. Taking a note of Southwest Airlines' idea of keeping things simple with a single aircraft type, National announced they would be using a standardized fleet of Boeing 757-200s. These were larger than the 737s that Southwest had, but they had longer legs. They were able to operate non-stop to any destination in the continental US. The size difference was also beneficial for the passengers too, as the 757s had just 175 seats, with 22 first class and 153 economy seats, offering a seat pitch of 40 inches and 33 inches respectively, which was greater than most of the legacy carriers offering at the time. The first aircraft arrived in February 1999, with a second coming in April. The airline received its air operator's certificate on May the 20th. The inaugural flights took place the following week on May the 27th with flights from Las Vegas to Los Angeles and Chicago Midway. I feel the need to mention the airline's phone number as I think it was pretty cool. It was 1-888-757-JETS or 5387. National had planned on launching operations with just four aircraft. However, by August the fleet had ballooned to 11 aircraft, so much for slow and steady. 
It seemed that the airline had a change of heart, and Michael Conway, who was now the airline's chief executive, said he expected to be adding 10 aircraft per year to grow the fleet to at least 40. National's first destinations were Los Angeles and Chicago, but these were quickly followed by New York's JFK, San Francisco, Dallas, Philadelphia and Miami. These destinations were all large international gateways, and it was hoped that National could negotiate interline agreements with overseas carriers. By August 1999, National announced that they had surpassed their 100,000th passenger mark. In October, they opened a members-only lounge at McCarran Airport. It's offered all the amenities of an airline's lounge that you have these days, just with more fax machines and data port hookups and less Wi-Fi. December would see the formation of National Vacations, a tour packaging division of the airline. It would allow customers to purchase a package deal of National Airlines flight and a stay at one of several Las Vegas hotels. The turn of the millennium was considered disappointing by Conway. Traffic to Las Vegas had been considerably lower than expected, however National had started making a profit by February 2000 and was expecting to show its first net quarterly profit by June. On the 12th of April National Airlines carried their one millionth passenger, completing the airline's thanks a millionth promotion, when a passenger on flight 11 from New York won free travel on National Airlines for a year. All remaining passengers on Flight 11 were given a free round trip, and to celebrate further, all passengers travelling across the network on April the 12th were given a coupon for a 20% discount on a future national flight. June 26 saw National Airlines agree a deal with both its leasing company and Boeing to acquire up to 20 new Boeing 757 aircraft, with 8 firm orders and 12 options. Four more 757s joined the fleet during the early part of 2000 and service began to Newark and Washington National. National Nights were soon launched by the Vacation Division, where travellers were offered deeply discounted air and hotel packages if travelling on selected red-eye flights from Chicago, Miami and Philadelphia. By mid-2000, National was looking at a share placement and initial public offering, expecting or hoping to raise over $200 million. With a private placement planned for the fourth quarter of 2000 selling shares at $7 each, they hoped to raise a further $35 million. They would use the money raised from the share sales to pay off their launch debts and then fund further expansion. Prospective destinations included Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal and Mexico City taking national into the international market for itself. On the 27th of July 2000 at New York's Kennedy Airport, a man waving a handgun stormed through security and ran onto National Airlines Flight 19, which was in the process of boarding passengers. He took the captain and first officer hostage, while the passengers on board the Las Vegas-bound Boeing escaped. After a five-hour standoff, he released the two pilots and surrendered to the authorities. This was the only notable incident to occur to this incarnation of National Airlines. One more Boeing 757 was delivered in mid-November, taking the fleet up to 16 aircraft. However, a few short weeks later, on the 6th of December, the airline filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. National Airlines was losing money at a rate of $2 million per month, and things needed to change, and fast. Things seemed to stagnate at National Airlines throughout 2001. No new aircraft were delivered, and the only new route opened were flights to O'Hare Airport in Chicago, meaning National was now serving both airports in the Windy City. National was still losing money like there was no tomorrow, and in June they obtained a court order to prevent Harris, who owned 49% of the airline, from collecting over $17 million in loans which it had previously given the company. Had Harris been successful in calling it in, there's no doubt that National would have been grounded then and there, as it would no longer have been able to receive cash advances from ticket sales. July 2001 saw ILFC attempting to help National by trying to broker a deal between National and an undisclosed quote-unquote major travel entity with strong ties to the Las Vegas market. By this point, National had debts of over $100 million, with just $22 million of that coming since entering bankruptcy protection. There was hope for the airline, however, with discussions taking place between National and various other parties, and while these were ongoing, the airline would have to make changes. One potential financer was Carl Icahn, the corporate raider who pillaged Transworld Airlines and saddled it with the infamous Caribou deal. Discussions with Icahn and Wexford Capital, who were already involved in National Airlines, were progressing well, with Wexford looking at acquiring National outright, 
and ICANN providing the financing to get the deal done. These talks were ongoing throughout early September 2001, as reported in Flight International's September 10th edition. In the aftermath of the September 11th attacks, the discussions between National Airlines and potential takeover partners stopped. By November, National had lost over $33 million since the attacks two months prior, and it looked like the writing was on the wall for the Las Vegas-based airline. However, Michael Conway revealed that he had secured significant capital from investors as well as backing from Harris, who was still a major shareholder in the airline. National Airlines had applied for $22 million in government aid through the Air Transportation Stabilisation Board, which had been set up in mid-September. Conway said that the airline would use the money to secure a fleet of smaller aircraft to use on shorter flights in the hope of increasing yields. The ATSB rejected their application and forced National Airlines were on their own. One effect of 9-11 was that global demand for aircraft dropped. Added to that, the demise of larger airlines such as Canada 3000, Sabina and even the mighty Swiss Air into the mix and there were surplus airframes everywhere. National Airlines saw an opportunity. They took on three more Boeing 757s in early 2002. They did want smaller aircraft, but in an effort to keep costs down, opted to maintain a standardised fleet. An interline agreement was reached with VG Airlines from Belgium, offering international arrivals at Los Angeles Airport a chance to connect to a National Airlines domestic flight. National also announced new destinations, including Seattle, West Palm Beach and Reno. The Vacations Division started offering flight and hotel packages to Reno in the hope that folks would like to visit the other major gambling city in Nevada. The short flight time also meant flights could be slotted into existing schedules and thus improve the fleet's productivity. In August 2002, National Airlines Vacations began offering Las Vegas stopover packages, allowing passengers connecting through Las Vegas an opportunity to spend the night in one of the many Vegas hotels. The end came on Wednesday the 6th of November 2002. Flight 354 to Dallas departed Las Vegas at 4.20pm and marked the final departure for National Airlines. The airline which employed over 1,500 people was grounded. So, what went wrong? They say timing is everything. I'm not going to blame the September 11th attacks for the downfall of National, as the airline had been struggling for well over a year prior to that dark day. Any airline will incur considerable losses when first starting operations. The key is to stem those losses and start bringing in the money quickly to keep oneself in business. National had arguably the largest startup capital of any newly launched airline in the US. They had a great setup with the casinos and hotels, and a very good onboard product, so surely it should have been a success. Even before National took to the skies there was some scepticism. Las Vegas was at the time the only major city in the country without a major airline hub. Traffic was high enough, and with the expansion of the resort itself there certainly was a demand for more flights. The fact that the airline was losing over $2 million a month suggests something was seriously wrong at National. By using the larger 757 on the longer flight sectors compared with Southwest and their 737s, National believed that their higher aircraft utilisation would allow them to offer a full service but with low fares and still make a profit. The main problem was that despite demand for flights to Las Vegas, those were by far and wide tourists, who while appreciating a low fare and full service with all the bells and whistles, would by and large vote with their wallets and take the cheapest option. There just wasn't enough demand for business class travel, hence why so many airlines had pulled Vegas bound flights in search of better yields elsewhere. The aftermath of 9-11 drove prices down further at a time when costs were increasing, fuel prices started to rocket and insurance companies began profiteering with exorbitant rate increases for terrorism and war cover. Seizing an opportunity to take additional aircraft and expand was a risky move. Right up until National ceased operations, Conway repeatedly said he wanted to expand with more aircraft year on year. Perhaps he didn't learn from his time at America West. They expanded far too much too soon and had to enter bankruptcy protection in order to survive. Perhaps he did learn, and that this gamble was like oh so many in Las Vegas, it was just that this time both the house and the player lost. That national survived for over a year post 9-11 was impressive. 
that it spent over half its life in Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection raises so many questions. Firstly, about the airline, but also about how airlines in the US are rather unfairly allowed to operate in bankruptcy compared to airlines elsewhere is something we may have to look at in a future episode. In my opinion, the timing of the airline was off by a few years. Las Vegas in the late 90s was still growing. Considering the current scale of operations at McCarran with Spirit, Allegiant and the mighty Southwest, I believe had National started operations a few years later, then perhaps they would still be around. The casino resorts have changed too since then, with several mergers making much larger corporations, meaning that there may have been more funds available to support the airline now. Then again, as of June 2019, Carl Icahn's been building up stock in Caesars Entertainment and pushing them to sell assets, so maybe not. Until next time, thank you for watching.